The following interview was conducted with Jaris Jean Eikenberry, Bachelor of Science 1959, on Monday, May the 4th, 2009, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon to you. Good Thank afternoon. you very much. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay, I was born in uh, just outside of a little town called Bringhurst, which is kind of considered a southern suburb of Flora, which is about 25 miles northeast here. And uh, my uh, father was L. Delbert Eikenberry, and my mother was Vera Black Eikenberry, and uh, I had a brother. I was born in November of 1936 on a farm. Dad was, was farming at that time with my, my grandfather, who lived uh, just three miles west of there. And uh, we moved uh, uh, to the farm that I grew up on, uh, which was 100, 100 acres. Uh, and my grandfather had 120 acres. And we rented another, for a total of about 400 acres. It was a general purpose farm. Uh, we had a, a registered Guernsey dairy herd, which put, my, put me through Purdue University. We raised some hogs. I had a few chickens, just like you used to do in the old days and uh, cleaning out the chicken house one day and, and always wanted to be in agriculture, but I decided I didn't want to be in that part of agriculture, so I chose to go to Purdue University. Uh, well, tell us about your early years and also high school before college. I uh, yeah. graduated from, uh, from Flora High School. I went all 12 years there. Um, only 29 in my graduating class, uh, but it was, it was a good education. So I was primarily on a college prep, they, even in those days, uh, we had we did college prep. I'd take all the math and the science because I knew I wanted to be a vocational agriculture teacher. That was my, and to do that, I had to be qualified to be biological sciences and also uh, maybe chemistry. So, so I had, uh, but other than the, the 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 usual academics, I was very much. I was played in the band. I was I was a singer. Uh, so I, I, I'm a piano player, and a lot of people know me only as that, as a matter of fact, even to this day. And um, graduated in 1955. Um, <clears throat> I'm public speak, I was in public speaking, won a state contest in public speaking, and I was a, a state champion dairy judge. So uh, those were my primary activities. I did not play in sports because we had a dairy operation. My dad said either I needed to get up early in the morning and help milk, or I had to come home after school and feed everything. And I never have been a morning person. <clears throat> so I chose the latter, and I'd, I'd get off the school bus, and I have about three and a half hours of work yet after I got off home. So it kept me out of scouts, out of sports, all of that. But, I, I became a musician, and I always kidded my basketball playing brothers that uh, I was taking care of their girls for them. While well, well, they were playing, huh? <laughs> um, my experience on the farm was a good one. Uh, we made a very good living. I, 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 my earliest uh, remembrances are was during World War II. Uh, I don't remember uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Of course, being in the country, we were a little bit isolated, although we listened to the radio like crazy. Sure, as everybody else did. Yeah, that's right. But I followed World War II by, and, no, and we took the uh, Lafayette Journal Courier by reading the comic strip for Joe Palooka and Terry and the Pirates. And so I had some idea of what was going on and uh, had some relatives in the service. We didn't lose any anybody that uh, was, was, was a relative of mine. But it became, I was interested in the military even in those days, and uh, which uh, was the reason why when I did enroll in Purdue, I enrolled in ROTC also. But as I said, I, I uh, knew I was going to be studying agriculture probably at Purdue. I, I, li I listened to Purdue basketball games back in the 40s. I was listening to the game in 1948 when the bleachers collapsed. I didn't understand what had happened because there was so much confusion. But, uh, of course, we saw it in the paper the next day. And, and uh, my dad listened to the farm report every noon on WBAA. My good buddy, who became a good friend of mine, uh, Horace Tyler, Ace Tyler, uh, was, uh, would give the markets and the weather and all that stuff. So 
uh, I have Purdue University and being 25 miles away, uh, and I was in 4-H for eight years, uh, and Purdue was Mecca at, uh, to the 4-H program, and uh, so it, it just seemed a natural thing. I did consider going to Manchester College to study meteorology. I enjoyed weather, and of course you can't be in agriculture without uh, being a fan of weather. But I had a great uncle who was a professor of psychology up in, in Manchester, and he was one of my very, very favorite people. He was a very, very early influential person. He was a soft-spoken man, stood about six foot two, had a full hair, to brilliant white hair. And he said, no, he says, I think you need to go to Purdue and study agriculture. You've already got 17 years experience. And I, so I took his advice. It's a name. He is the grandfather of Jill Eikenberry, the actress, and, and, and she was on the TV series L.A. Law. I recognize yeah, the name, sure. Yeah, I, I've been very happy with the fact that Jill, Jill kept the name, you know. Ever since. <laughs> right. uh, but that, that, uh, that, that, that and uh, I entered Purdue right after, right after graduating from... Uh, well, tell us about I, the early days, and did you live on campus? I imagine you did yes. in the residence hall. State Street Courts. Uh, we were the first uh, uh, the students in. Of course, they've been torn down since. Where then. were they located? On State Street, uh, where, where um, Fowler House is now. Okay. Where it was police... called Student Union Courts in Fowler House, and it was a series of courts that were individual. Uh, I spent my first two years there, and because they were mostly freshmen, I got an experience, a chance to experience student government very early because you didn't have to compete with the upperclassmen for the for the jobs. And something else very interesting happened there in our soph my sophomore year, and actually over the summer of the freshman year. Uh, one of the, the sororities, and I cannot remember anymore who it was, was building a new house. And so they housed them in courts one and two. While the house was being built. Yeah. yeah. And so we were the first co-educational uh, residence hall in the Big Ten. And they, in 1956, they asked us to send two extra delegates to the Big Ten Conference to talk about that. And uh, it, it, was, it was an extremely uh, in interesting experience because uh, dining hall and the residence hall was typical college. But when they put those girls in there, and they ate in the same dining so the, You ate there too as well? Yeah, that's okay. right. And there, we had our own uh, Fowler house on the back of it where they, where where they, they served the meals. That's where they served the meals. And it's amazing the effect it had on, on the demeanor of the boys, the dress. And it was a, so that was kind of an interesting experience. Sure is, yeah. And uh, at that time, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily an ear musician when it comes to piano. I play a lot of ragtime, I play a lot by ear. So I fit into a lot, of, uh, a lot of things. As a matter of fact, as I entered my freshman year, in those days, each high school in Indiana could send one of their freshmen to a, a Purdue freshman camp. And the, the concept was, it was an orientation. And we went a week ahead of anybody else, went out to old Ross camp, which is now 4-H camp. And uh, they teach us the uh, school songs and yell leaders came out and taught us the yells and we learned all about the traditions and proper orientation, how you, if you, you'd be killed if you took off your green beanie, you know, all those things. But one of the interesting things that happened, Al Stewart was, direct, was the director of PMO in the Glee Club at that time, and he came out to teach us Hail Purdue and some of the fight songs. And he walked in and he says, he said, I, I don't suppose there's anybody here that can play Hail Purdue. He said, I, the accompanists were changing for the Glee Club at that time, and, and the new guy wasn't here yet. And I raised my hand, and from that point on through my four years in college, the dean of men would call me by my first name, and it wasn't because I was such a hotshot student, because I had a name like Jarris Eikenberry, and I played the piano. And you knew Hail Purdue. <laughs> and they as knew Hail Purdue. As a freshman. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I lived, lived two years in Student Union Courts Fowler, uh, Fowler House, and, and uh, my junior year, that was close for you because most of your courses were on Ag Campus over in Enid. That's and, right. Or, or, uh, and we were. This was the second year that life science was open. That was that was a big deal. It was the largest educational building of size on, on 
a lot of uh, on any campus in uh, Indiana, and excellent facilities. And and now they're thinking about having tearing down tunnel because it's gotten too old. <clears throat> but uh, th those four years while I was at Purdue were were fantastic. 1955 through 1959 was the biggest building time in Purdue history. That's when Stewart Center was built. That's when the H residence halls were built. That's when chemistry was built. Uh, a lot, a lot of the, the, the veterinary school was built. There's a tremendous amount it of construction. It opened in 1959. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. There's just a tremendous amount of things going on. I remember sitting in an English class watching them built Stewart Center. Which was, they that, was Heathlin Hall uh, built at that time, or yeah, it was already that, built? Yeah, been built yeah. Huh? that's where my class was. You look out across the sea, and, and I was surprised. Uh, we just celebrated our 50th, and uh, one of the newsreels for 1959 uh, showed showed a lot of that uh, uh, going on. That was kind of a highlight of our cl uh, class experience. But uh, my junior year. Uh, I, I attended the Church of the Brethren as a kid, and the Church of the Brethren formed a co-op. So we formed a co-op called Stellar Brothers, located at that time right across the street east from the horticulture building. And it was a brand new co-op. As a matter of fact, we moved in. There was not even any running water yet. They hadn't got the remodeling done. So we had to use the restrooms and, and the water uh, in the horticulture. We, we had access to the horticulture restrooms 24 hours a day. Uh, that was an interesting experience. Uh, I learned how to uh, peel potatoes and, and you know all the uh, co-op living was fantastic. I was kind of sorry that I didn't do that earlier. I, I looked at the Greek system. I, I rushed because I was I was fairly social uh, but uh, I had this cute little chicky babe that I was dating in Camden, Indiana, and I was playing the piano for a, d a dancing school on the weekends. It kept that me out of Saturday classes. Uh, so was the dancing school here in town? Or no, it was in, in Flora. Okay. In Flora. And uh, uh, so I, I didn't have Saturday classes. but uh, that, uh, And then also I, I felt like I was a good enough singer that I could have made the glee club, but I just didn't have the weekend time. But I did rush because I wanted to see what it was like. And I had uh, friends who just, who didn't get asked and who, who didn't get what asked by the ones they wanted. And I was asked by three. <laughs> I'd have probably been an acacia if I'd have done anything. But uh, so I I kept my, I, I, so I, I, my weekends were, I did go back and forth at home because it was only 25 miles away. And I, I, you I had, had a car on campus then? Oh, a 1947 Chevrolet five passenger coupe, black with a sun visor and a spotlight. I bought it with money that I saved for $732 in 1952. <laughs> so it was, a mag it was a magnificent. I was the first one in my class to drive. My birthday is November the 2nd. And in, in 1941, when I started school, my uh, you had to be six by November 1st. And they could have probably pushed me in, but my folks, with, with a great deal of wisdom, because in those days we didn't have kindergarten, uh, said, no, I'll let, we'll let him go into the next class. So I was the oldest one in my class that had not failed a grade, so we had a couple of them. But, so I had the first one to have a car, and that is so important in 1955, yeah. or in, in 1953. Okay, where was I? Okay, co-op in my junior year. And you had to do your own. Everybody chipped in cooking and all. That's all right. Okay. Well, we did. About how, well, how many boys were in there? About, I think there were thirty-two. Okay. Uh, uh, there, there were a lot of a lot of nice kids. I've maintained a lot of contact. Dr. Leon Thacker, who is, has been and just now stepped down as the head of the Animal oh, Disease the Diagnostic Laboratory, was a was a stellar brother. Oh, okay. And oh. there's several others that, uh, but uh, that was an interesting experience. But uh, I decided to get married between my junior and senior year, uh, which was kind of a dumb idea. Uh, uh, I, I signed up for ROTC. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me digress just a second on the ROTC thing. Dr. David C. Fendler was Associate Dean of Resident Instruction at the School of Agriculture for 197 years, it seemed like. Or 200. <laughs> yeah. here, right? Pick a number. Everybody had but to talk Dave to interviewed every single incoming young uh, aspiring 
freshman ag student. And one of the things he, during the interview, he would very carefully ask questions and he would find out uh, that I had uh, an interest in the military. And he said, he, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is almost direct quotes. He said, I, he leaned across the desk at me and he said, son, do you read the history books? I said, yes, sir, I, 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 I am a student of history. I like history. I made straight A's in school and all he said, well, you know, about every five years we get into a ruckus. Somebody drops a saber somewhere, and we go through mobilizing. And he said, you never know when it's going to happen. And he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity. He said, you've got to have a certain number of, of uh, electives anyway. He said, why don't you join the ROTC? Number one, you know what's out on the other end. And number two, if somebody gets into a ruckus, he said, you would have the opportunity to be an officer and a gentleman instead of a butt private with an M1 in your hand. That's a direct quote. And boy, I signed up ROTC, and I would not have had to done anything. People who graduated in the late 50s were too, too young for Korea and too old for Vietnam. And I had a lot, uh, very few of my classmates went that way, although at that time Purdue University was mandatory. ROTC. Yeah, I you either banned or ROTC or you had to have an excuse. And we'd put 7,000 students on the parade field. And uh, it was an interesting experience. I would have to say that I, while I have two degrees from Purdue and, uh, and my work required a lot of teaching or, or at least uh, instructional uh, where I had to exercise leadership, no, no better leadership training I, I, uh, it came to me from any form, uh, better than the U.S. Army did. So I that was part of it. So when I decide, we decided to get married between my junior and senior year, that was also the, the junior year. That's when you go to ROTC summer camp. You spend eight weeks. That's where you get your basic training after you get what it feels like to be a private. And so I got married in June and left the last of the month for eight weeks of basic training uh, as a ROTC cadet, but uh, my wife, uh, uh, she's not here today, she's uh, playing girl day with her sister down in Indianapolis. Um, but, That's uh, a good expression. <laughs> she was, uh, she was uh, we dated a long time, as a matter of fact, she was only 14 mm -hmm. when I first dated her. I, I didn't know it, but her parents knew my parents. And in a small town like Flora, that's, that's all you needed. Mm -hmm. They trusted me to, and I never dated anybody else. I, I'm about three years old. She is actually two and a half. And uh, so we got married and moved into married student courts. We were the second one, second uh, couple to live in 131-12 Nimitz Drive, which is still there, but I understand it's on the hit list. Uh, and she worked at Lafayette National Bank. And I made the best grades I made in four years. I was on the dean's list. I, 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 my senior year was fantastic. Uh, uh, I am. I was extremely happy with my education at Purdue University. Uh, the ag campus is a nice place to go to school. Uh, we would we would refer to professors by their first name, and uh, it had an entirely different feel. Uh, we hated to cross State Street if we didn't have to. But uh, that's and then. Um, Graduated on time. My wife became pregnant uh, during that time, very quick, as a matter of fact. And my son, who's about ready to turn 50 in about a week and a half, uh, was born five weeks early. The last day of classes, she had to have a cesarean section. I was commissioned a second lieutenant. I graduated. I moved and started a job in five days. I never, I don't remember a single moment of graduation. I just, it was just a blur. My wife was to be in the cesarean section. She was in, had surgery. She wasn't yeah. doing any tap dances in. Anyway. But that's where, that's where we, uh, that's that's where we got through Purdue University. I don't know. The, um, I was a, uh, I made better uh, uh, grades in college than I did in high school. Good. And I wasn't a bad student in high school, uh, but. Uh, you know, I, I made, uh, I think it's part of maturity, and Probably. I married well. That's another thing. So. And, of course, at that time, the semester started in September. 
Yeah. And uh, then you still had a summer session, and then ended in January, and then went on from there. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was that, that uh, two week thing at the end of Christmas. Was it yeah. the and the commencement was in Elliott Hall of Music, and see uh, Hovde yeah. would have been the president yeah. at that time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, that was a uh, uh, that was quite a year that year, but uh, I remember an awful lot. I still have an awful lot of friends uh, from my senior year. Um, ag students uh, tend to be very close. You know, we knew. That. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just lost a great friend and Ron Fruitt. Uh, Ron uh, Fruitt and Eikenberry sat together in almost every class. He was the class of '59. Yeah, yeah. Right. He was a classmate of mine, and we did a lot of classes together. So I, and main, of course, I've been on campus about as long as he has too. Right, so yeah. we've maintained a relationship for a long time. Right. Then what came next after commencement? What uh, What did you do next? Okay, uh, and I also had some graduate education yeah. too. Yeah, I uh, I graduated in, in May, and I, I tried to find some, uh, maybe, uh, uh, number one, I was under orders to go for two years of active duty, but they only had me going in in May of the following year, May of 1960. Well, I couldn't get a teacher's contract. That didn't fit, you know. Uh, so I remember my ROTC instructor, so he said, well, you go up to Fifth Army Headquarters, which was just at Hyde Park in Chicago at that time. He says, the only time you can ever bypass channels. Go up and ask them if they move up your date so you go a little earlier. So I did. I went up and I told him, I said, I'm not, at that time, uh, about 70% of my graduating class uh, only got six months of active duty because I didn't want second lieutenants in 1959. They were downsizing like they always do in a stupid way after a war, but anyway, that's another that's another whole tape. But uh, so I went up and and yeah, they they said we'll move you up to November. I said well that's fine. And uh, little did I know when I got my orders, in November it was for six months. They changed it. I didn't ask to be changed, but uh, uh, they changed it. So I from when I graduated in May of 1959 until when I went on active duty with the U.S. Army in, in uh, November, I worked as an agent in training in Carroll County, which is mm. my home county, and worked mm -hmm. in 4-H programs for rural youth. And uh, that pretty well convinced me that I I probably didn't want to do the classroom. I liked the idea of getting out and working sure. with farmers and, and that kind of thing. Sure. So I. I knew an extension was going to be my thing, and went on active duty in in November. Went Where to did your family go then at, while you were gone? Well, they stayed at home. Uh, in uh, Flora. Yeah, in Flora, uh -huh. with actually with my parents, and then she stayed some with her. They just she's from Camden, so it's only sure. seven miles further. Uh, during that, the, the first part of my active duty, and in December, I graduated from the U.S. Army Transportation School. I was a transportation officer, and uh, even though I served in a lot of different units, I served 28 years in the active reserve. Yeah, I served a lot, every unit needed a transportation officer, and, and you'll find out when I come a little later on why that became important to me now, but I'll tell you later. But, so uh, Joyce joined me in January in St uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, and uh, when I got out in April of 1960, um, I had a job waiting on me. Uh, at Randolph County, Winchester, Indiana, as an assistant county agricultural agent. So that was my first job. First job paid $5,200. But bread was cheap. <laughs> Gas yeah, was put, cheap. You have to put all those things in that <laughs> yeah, perspective. Right. Right? Quote dollars and yeah. cents, I know. Well, anyway, um, uh, so I uh, did, did the agent in training in Carroll County, working for a, a uh, I know one of the things you mentioned to me is who people are important to me. Uh, my vocational agriculture teacher, Harold Thompson, in, in uh, high school, and Harold, Harold Berry, who was a county agent in Carroll County at that time. Uh, he was a great encourager, encouraged me to play a lot of piano. As a matter of fact, I, sh I should mention that I met my wife when she was 14 at a Carroll County 4-H junior leader meeting, and I was a president of the junior leaders that year, and uh, set up... Uh, piano after the meeting we were sitting around kind of singing and she walked up to the piano and I asked who that was and so I put her on all my fair work schedules except 
her last name was Miller, and there were two Millers in, in 4-H at that time, and I put the wrong Miller on my work committee at the fair, but that's another story. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, so I did, my, that was my first employment, and it was an extremely good experience because I didn't, I knew the people in the county, and I knew, I had just been out of 4-H one year at that time, and sure. uh, worked to worked the state fair. We had, a, in those days, exhibitors stayed in the boys camp on the state fair. And I was an assistant director down there. Harold worked down there, and then I went on active duty and got and got off uh, of active duty in April, and then went to Winchester, a very conservative part of Indiana. A lot of a lot of more uh, of, uh, Quaker uh, in influence. Uh, it's a it was a different county kind of county agriculturally. I have very very strong friends to this day from the, those people over there. They really took me in. And uh, uh, it was a good experience. I was there uh, just 18 months. I got a chance to go to Madison County, Anderson, where Harold Berry, who had been my counties in Carroll County, had moved to. So I worked with Harold again. And at that time, the, the Extension Service uh, said, we're going to change this idea. You, had, you became an assistant county agent. You worked with 4-H and youth programs, and you got promoted to county agent, and you had to stop doing that. They said, no, some people are really meant to work with youth. And I think I felt that. And so I was the second extension agent appointed in the state of Indiana to a new uh, function that was called Extension Agent Youth. Uh, Al Pell up in Fort Wayne was the first. I was the second one. Now it's it's standard. Sure. So you can spend your whole career working. I don't know. I was... I, Madison County was fantastic. Great uh, contrast between urban and, and, and agricultural and rural, and uh, a lot of, a lot of interest in 4-H there. A very large fair. We had a we had uh, 1,700 4-H members. Was one of the largest in the state, and yeah. it was. I was just really happy with what was going on. And I get this phone call from a guy who was on a third person account in my long lineup. I'm glad I met them types. His name was Al Carter. He was director of services for the state chemist office. And he said, we have gotten your name from the director of extension as assistant county agent that, that might be interested in coming to work for us. And um, I said, what, what do you do? He said, well, we're regulatory. We, and I thought, no, nah, I don't want anything to do with cops and robbers. I had, I, you know, my military experience was enough on that. And, but I took a couple of days off before I came over for the interview, and I visited feed companies and seed companies and fertilizer companies and said, what area you where you yeah. were? Yeah. Well, I went, I went to Fort Wayne. Okay. It was in Central Sorry, I remember that. But what do you think about the state chemist office? And there was a guy down here in Crawfordsville. And he was in a seat company, and he says, well, he says, you'd be working with Al Carter. And he said, he's the only guy I know that would come into my business and write a stop sale against 5,000 bushel of seed, and I'd be shaking his hand and telling him thank you when he left. I said, no, that's kind of regulatory work I can handle. So I did the interview, and this this is probably... Uh, I don't know. I, the good Lord must really smile on me good in this because it, the interview was to hire me to be an administrator of the Indiana commercial feed law. Uh, and I, I would work for a couple of years uh, doing fertilizer and, and in those days herbicide work, sitting right next to the guy who was the feed administrator, and I learned his work for a couple of years and then moved in. Well, I was the first non chemist that they ever hired. They finally figured out that an administrator is a guy that works with, he gets in the lab and there's inspectors to work, and the complainants you know, working the feed companies out here, and uh, has a lot of public, who's the public relations job. Sure, and they sure. said, a chemist becomes a chemist because he doesn't particularly want to work with people in the first place. And say, no, wait a minute, we got this all wrong. We'll bring this guy on campus and we'll stick him in some graduate level chemistry courses so he knows that the guys upstairs are lying to him or not. And that's exactly what they did. My master's degree was highly tailored. If I had wanted to go on for a PhD, I'd have had to take about half of my coursework again. It was consumer psychology, it was statistics, and I took 17 hours of graduate level organic biochemistry. 
I, it was, and I worked full time. <laughs> had a young family. <laughs> and by this time, I had. Well, we got it done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And but the the wisdom of Dr. Forrest W. Quackenbush, who was a state chemist and head of the biochemistry department at that point, the wisdom he had was that uh, that. And, and consequently, all of the other positions, like the, the seed position, the fertilizer position, the pesticide position, were, were all changed the same way. So I was the grand experiment. I walk into the office, and they're looking at me, and here comes this young buck that's going to change everything we're doing. It was an interesting experience. I pulled on every bit of public relations and good manners and that I ever had. Right. But it worked do very it. well. It worked very well because I think, particularly among the staffs, I had I had to work along with the fertilizer and seed and pesticides. The other, other each of those areas had an administrator, and there was a state chemist. So there was not very much hierarchy. I had one guy, and we didn't answer to the university except in matters of personnel. The state chemist was set up in such a way that. We said we agreed to be on the campus, be a part of the Purdue staff, get all staff privileges, but in return, we followed all the same rules of, of personnel and pay. Uh, we followed. We got the same pay raises as everybody else did, even though sometimes, uh, see, our our income was based upon uh, we collected so many cents a ton for each ton of feed sold and fertilizer. Right. So when the industry was doing real well, we had pretty good sized income. We literally built two thirds of the biochemistry building. With is that where you were? Is that where it's yeah. housed? Okay, yeah. that's where you're housed. Uh, by by putting money back into the university, we we funded a tremendous amount of seed and, and fertilizer and feed research. So that a lot of that money, so it kept it kept us even. Right. But uh, the idea of working, um, and I, you, you mentioned uh, Ken, uh, he was my vet contact. If I had a, a case I was working on which required some knowledge of veterinary medicine. He was a guy I talked to. And uh, Jim Foster over in animal science. and, and uh, You had some contacts you know, in the department, which was across, good. Yeah, yeah and they're sure. right, they were right there. Sure. And, and because I always felt, I had a sign over my desk, and it's not very good grammar, but sure, put the point. And this is Al Carter. This is one, one of the things he told me. He says, your job is to keep people out of trouble not trying to catch them in trouble. And I went in with that attitude and uh, served for 37 and a half years in a function, function where we had state law and had authority to fine and send people to jail, prosecute. I never prosecuted a single case in 37 and a half years because we never had to. Right. You work with a, with a industry that was extremely competitive and they did not want to make a mistake. And so that was the, that was the, 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 the gist flow. of the work. Uh, animal feeds and fertilizers and all that have to be labeled so the consumer knows what he's buying. They have to meet the con conditions of the label. They have to uh, make their products in such a way that will not either be adulterated or misbranded. That, that's in, in, a, in a real thumbs and nail sketch. That was kind of what the work was about. I worked with the inspectors who called on the industry. I, they brought in samples so we could check, and they go up to the lab, and uh, uh, they would. Uh, so I, had, but I had to vie for a time with the inspectors with the fertilizer and seed sure. and everybody else. Right. And I worked very closely with the rest of the university because I, there wasn't a single animal science student that didn't hear me at least twice. I talked to all of the freshman veterinary students, and then they, I'd go in for a special class at the, as they were getting ready to graduate to remind them that the license to do veterinary medicine did not allow them to violate Indiana law. And also during this time, there are two or three significant things in my career. I don't, know if that's, I don't know if that's where you want Please me to go, go or not. Yeah, go ahead. Early in my career, I was recognized by uh, one of Dr. Quackenbush's counterparts in the state of Kentucky. And he t kind of took me on his wing, you know. And uh, one of the things we did, we just said, at that time, we were administering a law that was originally written back in 1901. 
and the principle of labeling and meeting, taking samples and that stuff. We were starting to use a lot of drugs and antibiotics and animal feeds, and we said, you know, we can't wait and catch somebody making a mistake. We got to make sure to prevent it. So we sat down and, and with a group of people, we set up a seminar because there's one of me in every state, and not enough large enough group to kind of come together. So we, the Association of American Feed Control Officials, of which I'm a life member. Uh, have the uh, start holding a seminar to train ourselves and in doing that we said hey you want to start all over we're going to throw all this law stuff out we're going to start with a blank piece of paper we hired a mississippi attorney from washington dc he was one of the neatest guys. he wore a string tie and had a heavy accent full head of hair white mustache. I mean, to fit the Kentucky Colonel right down to the... Right, sounds it. And he came on board and challenged us as from the legal side. And we completely wrote a whole new concept of regulatory. And we put those things in the law that was not subject to change all the time. We were changing the law all the time because technology changes. Right? So we set up an enabling act and then would write regulations interpreting was in well, I got in on the ground floor of that, and as a young young guy, I mean, in my early thirties, uh, and it was such an ex uh, such an experience that I got a chance to do that because uh, now that law, if you go to Russia and you would ask to see a Russian feed label, it looks surprisingly like one here it does here. That's Sounds because good. one of the things I did when I when I retired was help them write the federal feed law for Russia. But anyway. That's another story. But that and the principle, uh, because we had so much medication going on, uh, FDA had joint jurisdiction. And we said, why aren't we competing here? Why don't we put this together? And so, again, I was on the ground floor of, of, of the, uh, that put together a joint state-federal inspection program that we would use federal authority. Uh, we would follow their procedures because we were dealing with, with drugs and antibiotics and, and potentially hazardous materials. And we would do the inspection because that's one thing we did better than they did. Uh, and and then uh, we would decide what action would be taken. If we needed to go across state line, they would do it. If, if we do it, we'd do it ourselves. So I was commissioned a, a officer in the Food and Drug Administration as well. I mean, all of our inspectors were, and uh, I've got a one of the. I got that medal up there. That's the Harvey C. W. Wiley Memo uh, Memorial Medal that the FDA gave to me. That uh, I thought it was really felt good because it was Harvey Wiley, you know, and uh, very cause, special because he was the first Indiana State chemist. You know? Well, anyway, so I got to uh, set up the Joint State Federal Inspection Program. And then one, one more, one more time, uh, uh, is when we finally came to the point we could not rely on sampling products to find out if they're adulterated or not. We could not wait to find out there's somebody made a mistake with a drug level one. Uh, so we had to set up a series of good manufacturing practices in which we said if you, to the feed manufacturer, if you follow these, chances of you're making a mistake is pretty slim. A lot of checks and balances in. And now this system is in the food in, it's in the food industry now, in the fertilizer industry, it's in the pesticide. Any place that handles any kind of hazardous materials, that concept is being used. But we started it. That's great. And I was chair of that committee. And so I've had some just some fantastic experiences. Right. right. And part of that happened because if you would ask somebody in the regulated industry, give me the top three or four regulatory programs in the country, every single one of those would be the ones that are like that Kentucky and Texas and here, they're university-based. Sure. It's where the resource, that's where the resources are too, yeah. as well. And we weren't political, see? Right. Now yeah, I'm the state chemist, and I thought, if I, uh, they tell me that Forrest Krakenbush almost got fired once because, um, oh, governor of Indiana, uh, from, Indi from here in Lafayette. Um, oh, um. Uh, yeah. Brannigan. Yeah, Brannigan. 
represented a client that we beat in court. <laughs> and it, it came back to roost, you know. But the, uh, the legislature wouldn't stand for it. We've always tried to maintain a close relationship with the, with the legislature. And uh, that's the reason uh, Terry Street just stepped down from the vice president of you know, governmental relations. That's what he did for the ag school was serve as a liaison with the, with the legislative branch. And so we worked through him a lot. And I got a chance to really uh, work firsthand with the, with sure. the government. And working with other states, we would exchange information. We set up that system. Uh, to where if I inspected an Illinois firm and found a little problem, I'd give him a call and let him straighten it out. Right. I bought it. So I had, all those procedures are still, That's great. still, you know, and I, I, I feel very proud. And it wasn't just me. It was, it was had a good time team in right. the right place. Right. It and, all, all just fell yeah. in place. So I had one of the most interesting jobs in the world. If you like animal animals like I do, I may be talking to an executive vice president of Ralston Purina one miss, minute, a dirt farmer in southern Indiana that lost half of his flock of six sheep, or a little old lady in Muncie, Indiana who saw a dead cardinal in her backyard just sure the bird seed was poison. And that broad range of people uh, and uh, trying to, and, and convincing the feed manufacturer that he was entitled to legitimate competition, and I made it made it good to blow the whistle on somebody, because I said you're entitled to, if he if he cheats, he's taking undue advantage of you. That's that's a, that's a business practice you shouldn't be able to. Not, doesn't make any difference what we say you should do it. You don't want him to do it. Yeah. And I'd get a lot of anonymous phone calls. You better go check on so and so. This is an anonymous cause. So yeah, Jack, thanks. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> so that, uh, and I served as feed control official uh, until uh, May of 1999. I retired at age 62. TIA Crep was good to me. I had a boss who was succeeded uh, Dr. Quackenbush, the state chemist, Elwin Shaw, that said, encouraged me to go as much into craft stock as I could. And I was up to 75% craft stock and while I was contributing. And boy, it paid off. You know, I was a little... Uh, I have a, uh, one question. Who appoints the state chemist? The governor of the state of Indiana. Okay. And is there a, is there a, is there a term? I'm thinking of the researchers might ask that. Is, is it for a specific term, period of time, or... No. Oh, it's open-ended? Yeah, it, but what if the governor... Cha I mean... I no, it's, it's, only, it's only changed if the governor wants to change it. It comes under review. I mean, he, he has, he, anytime a new governor came in, he was presented, you know, here are your appointments, and the state chemist was one of them. All right. But the Indiana Farm Bureau and the Indiana Feed and Grain Association and, and all our friends in the legislature were grabbing by the lapel and said, don't okay. you mess with it. This is a good system. It's working. Okay. And, I, I just and that's exactly what happens. Right. Uh, we've we never had anybody question uh, you know, and our people have retired when they should. You sure. know, uh, Bob Walsh, who's the current state chemist, was a, was a former state entomologist. I think he's entomologist, yeah. Hmm. And uh, so it, it it's uh, well, that's good. So there's longevity. I just yeah. I was thinking of the researcher might ask that question. That uh, my predecessor had his job for 43 years. Yeah. That's pretty good. Very good. And. Bob Rund, who was the fertilizer guy, Bob's passed away now, uh, he retired shortly after I did. He was fertilizer uh, for almost 40 years. The guy in the seed lab is Al Carter. He retired at age 68, died on the golf course at age 88. He told me it takes five years to retire. This is the same guy that I've been quoting. Yeah. He came in one day and he had, he had uh, cameras around his neck. I said, what are you doing, Al? And he said, well... I'm going to retire in five years. i got to find out if I want to do something. So we went down and he leased some cameras from Herm Barry, down Barry's camera shop. And he played around with them for a month to see whether or not he wanted to take up photography. He went into a gold trading club and he, he took up golf at age 68 <laughs> and died at age 88 on the golf course. 
So, interesting. So I've had some great people to, yeah, to right. come alongside. Yeah. And, um, I think that that's a uh, and I was I was recognized for my work. I, I'm a I'm a uh, uh, Governor Old Van made me a Sagamore of the Wabash. Uh, were you surprised when you got it? Yes, because I, at that time they were trying to slow things down or pass them out a little too fast. And I, I thought, nah. Even though Governor O'Bannon and I became good friends because we both smoked pipes, down at the state fair, I can't remember the year, he was still lieutenant governor. We were getting ready for the Farmer's Day Parade, and I said, Governor, why don't we go over? We had to go always go over in the corner because I... Pipe smokers made so much smoke, sure, you know. Right. Yeah. And so, why don't we go over and fire up? He said, I want to talk to you about that. He said, What's his wife's name? She's so famous. Oh, jo uh, oh. Joan or uh, Judy. Judy. She's fat, what a fantastic person. Still fantastic. But anyway, Judy's been on me about it. She's, she's getting tired of sewing up burned holes in my pants pocket when I put them. He said, I decided to quit. He says, I think you ought to quit. I said, Governor, are you giving me an order? And he said, yes, just like that. I put that pipe down and never touched it. <laughs> <laughs> and so Frank O'Banner and I knew each other. I might be the reason I... Uh, and I got recognized, as I mentioned, by the food and drug. Yeah. I was recognized as a, as a tremendous uh, member, of the leader of the opposition by the feed industry. I got a, But the one thing that I was recognized for that has meant more to me than anything else. That little plaque over there. I'm in the mm -hmm. Carroll County Agricultural Hall of Fame. I mean, I left the county as an 18 year old when I came to school and never really went back. But they recognized me because I was a Carroll County native. That's very nice. And it, it has really meant a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, I've all, to be recognized by people who really do know you. I mean, know all the good and the bad. And, and to recognize me for something I did outside the county. Right, that's very nice. And so, so I that that that's a pretty good. I did I did do some consulting. I. Uh, what are you the, doing in your reti in retirement? Um, <laughs> well, I remember I told you I. I oh, you I was going to ask about the retirees association. You're involved yeah. with them. Okay. I'm on the benefits committee, okay. and we, we're getting ready to redo our our uh, Medigap plan, you know, pure care plan. The best there is out there. It, it, uh, I've been on that, and uh, I'm their piano player. Roy Johnson and I do the music for almost everyone. Although there were uh, sixty or seventy people there, it's a it's a nice. It's very active. They've really fought hard. You know, we get. Most that was of started the same. by Dr. Hansen. He's the one that started. Yes. All right. Yeah. And as a matter of fact. Uh, we, our, our appointments. We go on a committee assigned by the president of the university, and uh, we have a direct route. To the, uh, Isn't uh, Murray Blackweller is your advisor? He was, and of course oh. Murray's right. leaving now. So you'll have somebody his, else. Yeah, uh, we've already met with him, and Martha Chiskin's got him check trained already. <laughs> <laughs> Martha's uh, chairman of our committee. If you want anything <laughs> done on this campus, I ask Mar Martha Chiskin to do it. Uh, 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 you have a favorite, how about a favorite Purdue tradition? I mean, an outstanding event, either of those or both. Uh, favorite kind of Purdue? Tradition. Tradition? Uh, oh, I don't know, hail Purdue. I, great. I mean, it's meant so much to me, and I've been personally, I've been very active in, in the Purdue Ag Alumni Association. I spent 13 years on their board, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, Maury Williamson, mm -hmm. when he... I, I hope you've done him. Yes, I have. I can say he should have been right, right up there with Earl yeah, Butts. Yeah. There's more. There's more history there than. Right. Uh, and he's and he's on my list. Uh, I remember seeing a guy. He could be standing in the middle of a, of a muddy field and say, "You know, if everybody get out there and fan this, it would all dry out." He'd have every farmer in the state of Indiana stand out there to <laughs> fan. Right. He had the ability to get anybody. Yeah. I did a lot of travel with him. I was his low budget piano player when he had to have entertainment and didn't, didn't have, you know, went out to a district meeting or a county meeting. Uh, he knew where all the truck stops were that had the best biscuits and gravy at one o'clock in the morning because <laughs> we never stayed out. He'd always drive. Right. I've he heard that. Yeah. <laughs> of course, he had two bad wrecks because of that. But, uh, 
<laughs> uh, how about an outstanding event? Event? Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Purdue. Any, well, up, and, up until about 2000, it was the annual Ag Alumni Fish Fry. I was privileged to serve on the board during those years, and I did a lot of piano playing. I did a lot of role acting. I did. I was on the gags committee that wrote the uh, the uh, the skit, which nobody followed, and which uh, finally I think was our demise. The staff got so big, uh, people didn't know each other anymore, and so much humor like that is inside, and yeah. so we it's had local. Yeah. And of course, in those days, we even had a we had a, a Christmas party for the ag staff that would use both ballrooms and low playhouse, and and we put on a full skit that lasted an hour. Uh, it was always some. It was uh, Earl Butts was the dean at then, and it was uh, Robin Hood and, and or alias the Earl of Butts, and there was Earl Bonizer Scrooge and the Christmas Carol, and Fred Hubdy always had a role in, in Robin Hood. He was a good King Frederick instead of Richard. And, you know, we had more fun. I bet, yeah. We made Dean's nervous. Dick Coles was just beside himself. He was afraid we were going to be smirch the name. When he retired, we decided the way to shut him up was put him on the committee. And he'd been the most rotten member of our committee we ever had, he became. <laughs> well, oh. okay. No, I would say the old Purdue Ag Fish Fry. Right, okay. Uh, in and uh, but I oh boy, I'm, I'm great, I'm a great sports fan. I go to all I've right. gone to football games and basketball. I'm gonna finally give up my men's tickets this year. And we go to all the women's games. Well, I like lots of women. Sharon's one of my I just played piano for the Indiana basketball women's basketball hall of fame, and she was recognized on the uh-huh. all star 25th sure. anniversary team. Yeah. And they tell me, I'm not supposed to say too much, but I think she's on the list to be inducted in the next couple of years. So, uh, so hey, I've been a sports fan, uh, but I uh, uh, act, stay active in Purdue retirees. That is a really powerful group. Yeah, well, it's uh, grown it, a lot over the years too, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. 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 And, and the people who really are, I mean, uh, Betty Nelson, you know, uh, there's just so many people like that in that group. And and so unassuming, they're, they're in a cocky person in a bunch. Mo- all those people don't participate in this kind of thing. See? <laughs> I gotcha. Any uh, now the boss in your car in summer? Any closing comments that you'd like to make? Well, uh, as you look back and look ahead, some and both. Well, I think uh, unfortunately the relationship of the office of the Indiana State Chemist and Seed Commissioner may be eventually changing because Indiana had, does have a Department of Agriculture. And I think uh, Purdue University has said that either you're going to be a part of Purdue or you're not. We're not going to, we're not going to let Department of Agriculture put an office on this campus. And so there is some decisions going to have to be, and I, I, I am very sorry about that because it'll, it'll take away this business of being in a in a in an environment of research and education, and after all, law enforcement is ninety percent education. Yeah, that's true. You got to convince people what the requirements are, and chances are, if they understand it, they're going to comply. You don't have to get the club out. Mm-hmm. So that 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 is a is a concern of mine, um, and my big concern is the fact that research has become so. Uh, heavily funded by the industry wanting using the research that it's just uh, I've, I've watched some of these people spend half of their time trying to raise funds instead of doing the research and that wasn't the case when I started mm-hmm. we had a lot of USDA funding then we've lost all that uh, so I'm but um, hopeful thought the thing is Purdue has had some excellent leadership I'm not so sure about this previous administration, but that he he had a job to do and he did it. Right. I mean, regardless of whether you liked him, Steve Baring is a f- favorite person of mine, uh, and I thought I wasn't going to like that IU guy when he came here, 
But he would do things like, this happened to Joyce and I three or four times. We'll be in a restaurant, and he's sitting there with me. And they'll invite him over to sit down and eat with you. And he would ask you questions he expected you to answer. <laughs> and they were loaded sometimes. <laughs> and it's just, you know, he was such a different, and of course, Hanson. I got to tell you, I know you I probably shouldn't take time, but Hanson was scared to death of horses. We didn't know that. So we did the King Arthur thing for the fish fry once. We put a crown on his head, made him king, put him up on this big Belgian horse. I was standing next to him. A live horse? On a live horse. And he had a phobia about horses. And I was standing during the Star Spangled Banner and all that stuff, you know, and he said, come on, get this thing going. Come on, let's get this thing over with. <laughs> I could hear what he said. I couldn't figure out what he was saying for it. What he was saying. Come find out he was scared to death, but he rode all the way in on that horse. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, the, the other thing I'm doing that came out of my military experience, I, I spent all my time in reserve. I didn't have to. I, for a lot of years, I carried some guilt about that. But I stood in the door. And I would have gone if I had to. And uh, But uh, Sonia Marjoram heard me say one day that I went in 1987 or retired. I said, uh, now I'm a retired trans Army Transportation Officer. You got any use for one? You know, I, we, we were friends all of our life. We raised our kids together. And it wasn't two weeks later she called me up. She says, uh, I've got to fill a vacancy on the uh, city bus board. So she put me on. She's I became the mayoral appointment, and I'm chairman of the board right now. Oh. So, and that's been a fantastic experience, entirely different, unrelated right. to other things. It's been a good experience. Right. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mr. Eckerberg. This has been very informative, very good. Thank you very much. <laughs>